Yeah. Well, I am so excited to find out some of the secrets of the supernatural that you found out from your father and from his uncle. Uh, and uh, because most people see you and they think of a, a prophecy right. teacher, mm -hmm. uh, a Jewish roots teacher, mm -hmm. and they don't know the supernatural. For instance, I don't think many of you know this. Did you know that he has an angel that has followed his third generational mm -hmm. angel that follows him now? What happens when that angel shows up? I, I, can, I can say this, you know, really before the Lord that I don't sense him all the time. But probably on 10 different occasions, out of absolutely, totally unexpected, not praying for it, not asking for it, when I have been in services, the shifting of the atmosphere is felt by everyone there. Even, even people that are backslid or away from God can sense it. And there's usually almost a weeping that comes. There's a real uh, holiness of God that shows up. There's a real just, just uh, awareness of God and awareness of the Holy Spirit that, sh that comes. And then what always happens, there either is a shifting in the sermon, totally without notes, without, the, I'll lay the scripture, the Bible on the pulpit and just go into a realm of ministry, or there comes a very heavy prophetic word, totally unexpected. Uh, where the Spirit of God gives a prophetic... Now, a prophetic word is an utterance under inspiration for the Holy Spirit without tongues and interpretation. If you're, if you're charismatic Pentecostal, you'll understand what I'm talking about there. And the other thing that I've noticed is that on one occasion, we were in a transition in the ministry, a very heavy transition, and I was so down because more weight was coming to me, more heaviness and weight, and I, I was complaining and said, Lord, how can I do this? Well, you've asked me to do this. I can't physically do this. And I'm... <laughs> I can't hardly talk. This is what happens to me when we talk about this. And I'm sitting in this big chair at my desk, and I turned this way, and I felt the hand come to the chair. When, when the hand came to my chair, every hair on my body stood up. See, the Holy Spirit's presence works from, from, let's say it in John 7, from the belly out. An angelic presence is around you. You'll, you'll never feel it in. You'll feel the anointing stir, but you'll feel it out here. Well, every hair of my body stood up, and all of a sudden, a weeping came to me. And the weight, within 10 minutes, the weight that was on me came off of me. And from that moment on, and, and really, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. My daddy always said, now, Perry, when you feel this presence, stay in it. Don't jump out of it. But I got so excited. This, this sounds crazy. I jumped up, and I ran through my office, and I ran to my secretary's office, beat the door down, knocked the door and said, you won't believe what just happened. Oh, my God, you can't believe what just happened. Well, they're all excited. And I run to another office. Then I realized, what am I doing? So I go back in there hoping it's there, and it's not there now. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, Perry, what did you do? I mean, what, no, would, what, you do? <laughs> no, what would have happened if I would have stayed there? Now, let me say this, and we're going to kind of flow this way for the people. One of the mistakes that I see in the contemporary church is we customize services for the benefit of the people. Isn't that called seeker sensitive? Yes, but it's all customized for a time frame. I've heard, I've heard pastors say, we're going to do a 55-minute service. Everybody knows how long the sermon and the, and the music is going to be. And here's the disservice we do to people. If we get them at the edge of the holy place or we get them into the presence of God, we then pull them out prematurely. And it's like a premature birth. When you have a premature birth, you, don't, you have an undeveloped baby. Something, in, it could be the heart, the lungs, or physically, it doesn't, it doesn't totally develop, and it has to stay in the hospital so long till the, till the full development comes. And we, we, we pull people close to the presence of God. And I'm, I'm not saying everybody does this, but too many do. And then we want them out by 12 because we're active. The kids got ball in the afternoon. They want to go to the mall, whatever the case is. And I've 
I feel so much for this generation because a lot of them have experienced church, but not the glory. And, and so what we do, we, 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 we customize the service to adjust it to the not needs of the people, and we, but we adjust it to the activities of people. And what happens is you cannot encounter depths with God until you move in the progression of the Spirit of God. And so, and I'm going to say this, I'm going to say this very carefully, but I grew up around, and some of the folks in the audience or some of those watching may understand this, but I grew up around the old classical camp meetings. And the camp meeting was where you had a tent or you had a big metal building. And back then we all wore suit and ties when it was 104 degrees, which I never, I never, thank the Lord we've come through that now, you know, but back in the day. And what would happen is as the presence of God would move, as the presence of God would move, they allowed the anointing to flow, and then altar services would break out. But I I can remember not not leaving the altars till, till midnight or later. And you would leave so refreshed and so into the glory that, and this is the truth, you could live off of little sleep. I've had revivals that went seven, eight, and 11 weeks, and we didn't miss a service a, a night. The people never missed, missed a night, and we didn't get out of church till one and two in the morning, and they're getting up at five and six and going to work, and people say, how could you do that? Because when you are in the glory, you lose the concept of time. Time becomes irrelevant. Time becomes irrelevant in the glory of God. What what you have shared is so important. Did did you get that? You're right on the edge of God showing up. And when God shows up, everything is possible. Everything. Yes. Yes. And yeah, well, it's noon. I got to run. Right. Bye bye. Right, right. Let's switch gears for a second. Okay. Because you have revelation that you learned from rabbis, and and I'm Jewish, and I've never heard this revelation (laughs) before. For instance, supernatural language, tongues. I've always been told, well, that didn't start till after Pentecost. Pentecost. But you have learned different. Tell me about that. All right. It was in the 1990s, Rabbi Yehuda Getz was the head rabbi, one of the head rabbis in Jerusalem at the Western Wall Heritage Foundation. We met him at night. We would go in there at 10 and 11 o'clock at night because he would pray at night from like 11 till 3 in the morning. That was his prayer time. And he asked me what I believed. I got to tell you, this this is humorous. So, and, and there's a picture of him right there. That's Rabbi Getz. That's the young Perry Stone. On the, the People can see that. The younger, the younger version. So he, what he's doing right there, and I don't want to get sidetracked, he's showing me where the Ark of the Covenant was hid in a certain location under the Temple Mount. And I don't want to get into that. I'll be sidetracked. So he, be, he asked me what I believed. And I said, you know what? He's kind of a mystic, so I'm going to just lay it on him. I said, I believe in the covenants. I believe in re- the redemption. of. Co- co-. And I said, I believe in casting out devils. And he looked at me and he said, um, there's a man at the Western Wall who prays, who thinks he's Elijah, but he's not. Could you go cast the devil out of him for me? <laughs> <laughs> it was hilarious. And that kind of bonded us at that point. And then I said this to I'm him. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I said this to him. I said, I also believe in speaking with other tongues, which is the prayer language of the Holy Spirit. And he looked at me without blinking. He said, oh, you mean the language of God? And I went, wait a minute. What do you know about the language of God? I'm thinking, I'm thinking he's thinking the Hebrew language or something like that. And he said, well, we have a Jewish tradition. And he said, I believe it. That on the day of atonement, when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, God gave him a tongue to communicate in a language that he was not familiar with that only him and God could talk in and no one could hear it. And I said, well, why would that be? He said, so that Satan and the spirits could not interfere with what he was saying. So, in other words, it was, it was a language of, of, of God or a language of heaven that was known only to God, the priest. And he said, I said, well, uh, what would happen later? He said, well, he would leave and exit the holy place, and he couldn't speak it again until the next year. So, I was, I, I, what happened with that is I became so curious about some of the uh, traditions. And, and let me say this. The Jews, as you know, Sid, being Jewish, have 
the Torah, but they also have the oral tradition. And some of the oral traditions can be based on rabbinical commentary, which can be a little off, of obviously. Of but there are oral traditions that were handed down for generations and generations and later put in writing that you can actually go to certain scriptures and you can see how it all pieces together. So you and I know, the reason I tell people don't read a lot of the commentaries, you know, because it can get off and people it's can't mixture. discern. Sure. Yeah, it's a mix. It's a mix. But in some of this, so I, I, I ended up writing a book called The Code of the Holy Spirit and used that as the introduction. But if I can go ahead and talk about the breath of the Holy for a minute. Or, I'll tell you what. Yeah. I want you to hold that thought. You thought that was amazing that they spoke in tongues? Wait till you hear about this. I mean, th th this is even more amazing. Uh, but if, uh, I just want to mention something about Perry's father's uncle. Mm -hmm. His name was Uncle Rufus. Did you know that Uncle Rufus was, uh, how, how educated Third grade. Was he? Third, Third grade only. Third yeah. grade only. Uncle Rufus could speak in any language mm -hmm. of anyone he spoke to. Yes. Third grade education and preach the gospel. Right. And Perry prophesied, I heard it come out of his mouth a little earlier before we went on the air, that these gifts that were imparted to him, right. he is going to start imparting them to you. We'll be right back. Hallelujah. We will return with more of our special presentation of Secrets of the Spirit in just one moment. The supernatural of God knows no bounds, and now there are no limits to equipping you to receive your supernatural breakthrough anytime, any place. ISN, the It's Supernatural online network, is now available for your mobile devices and smart TVs with this free ISN app. People are astounded at the miracles they've seen others receive on our TV programs. Now, viewers are experiencing that same touch of God, and you can too. ISN offers live streaming of programs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right on your mobile devices or smart TVs. Access our life-changing specials led by top world-class teachers, or choose from dozens of powerful episodes of It's Supernatural. Just go to your app store and download it for free. Television schedules were fine for my parents' generation. But with the ISN app, I can watch what I want on my schedule. Get ready to receive your supernatural breakthrough, your healing, your miracle. Download the free ISN app today. And now, back to our special presentation of Secrets of the Spirit World. Okay, Perry. Yeah. Uh, th this is amazing to me. Tell me about the breath of the holies okay. from these ancient rabbis' uh, yeah. teachings. Okay, there was a tradition that in the tabernacle of Moses, you knew when the glory of the Lord came down by, number one, the sound of a man breathing. It would be like breath, like, <sighs> like, like a wind blowing. And the second way you would know is the, the, in, where you have the chamber of the inner court and the Holy of Holies, we call it, where the inner curtains were. The curtains would start moving like a man's lungs breathing. They would expand in and out. And this became known as the breath of the holies. Now, what is interesting is in Hebrew, the word breath, wind, and spirit is the same word. You have to read the context of the verse to see what it's speaking about. It's ruach. And the ruach hakodesh means the Holy Spirit. Now, if you, if you start tracing this down, this is in the tabernacle of Moses. It became known as breath of the holy place, breath of the holies, holy breath, holy spirit. Hmm. So in other words, that breathing sound was a manifestation of the Ruach HaKodesh, which is the Holy Spirit or the spirit that's holy, the spirit of God. And the interesting thing about that is if we come to the New Testament in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 on the day of Pentecost, there is a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. And the Bible says it filled the house where they were seated. Uh, I want to sidetrack on one note. 
A few weeks ago before one of our big youth conferences in July, my body had completely shut down. I had a, I don't know what happened. I think it was a demonic attack, to be honest with you. And I had lost all energy. And I was telling my kids, I don't know that I'll be able to preach. And they said, you know, my daughter said, Dad, you got to preach. You know, we got 4,000 kids coming and they're expecting you to preach. And I went over to a lodge that we had built and I shut the door. And I had my grandmother's old prayer blanket. I got an old blanket that, you know, grandma slept on. I'm talking about one of them old, look like a hundred year old blankets. And I wrapped up in it and I laid on this little uh, Murphy's bed that pulls down and it's a private office area. And I just began to pray and I said, God, I am so tired. And this happened before the Lord in heaven, this happened. I have heard the air conditioner go on in that room and that, and I know what it sounds like. I thought the air unit kicked in, but it's coming from the other room into this room. And it goes, Ooh. it got so loud that it, my ears start hurting. It filled the room. And I'm telling you, I have never been more terrified in my life. Could this have been what happened in Pentecost? Thank you. Ab- you know what? Absolutely. The first thing that came to my mind, yes. I heard the Holy Spirit say, a sound from heaven like a wind, a sound from heaven like a right. wind. Now, I didn't see fire. It's dark because I'm laying there in the dark. I don't have lights on. But man, it lasted. And my hair standing up and the Holy Spirit energized me supernaturally. And the next day I had, yeah, the next day I had, I had some of our young people and I said, you know what? We got conference coming up. Let's take a break. And we went up to Pigeon Forge, Tennessee at my favorite place, the Pancake Pantry. And we (laughs) ate and hung out and we sang songs and shouted and laughed and spoke in tongues and just all the way up and all the way back. And I preached that conference and felt as much strength as I do right now. So the, the Spirit of God... You know, when we, when we talk about the manifestation of the glory of the Lord, one of the things we have to understand is the joy of the Lord is our strength, and the Holy Spirit gives us supernatural strength when we need it. When Elijah was under that tree, he had an appointment under a Jennifer right, tree. I, I'm going to tell know? you something that I believe, Pam. Yeah. I believe that if you have faith in the promises of God, mm-hmm. there's no reason when you get older, come on, such as I am, that every cell of your body cannot be energized stronger yes, than when you were 30 years of age. Come on. I believe that, Harry. But Come I want to get to more secrets yeah. uh, of the spirit world yeah. with you. Okay. For instance, your, your dad, who I had the privilege of meeting, yeah. uh, uh, is... He gave you a pro- prophetic word, too. He God did. was going to use you. He did. And the, well, the, profe- well, the one he gave me has not, to my knowledge, happened yet, yeah. but it's about ready to happen. Yeah. He said, one, uh, one day, Sid, you will be speaking in a supernatural language on the air, and you will get letters that people understood, understood what you were That's saying. Right. Do you remember him? That's right. Prophesying sure that to me? Yes. But... Just before your dad was promoted to heaven, he gave you some advice. What did he tell you? Okay, we're sitting in the house, and he had was 78 years of age at the time, and he said, I had a dream. And he said, in this, and I'm going to make the dream real short, but he said, in this dream, I'm in a church service, and I'm seeing the enemy attack people. I'm seeing him attack people. And he talked about the, the sexual sins. He talked about temptation. He talked about pressures. He talked about depression. He said all this was coming against God's people. And then he said, the Lord told me this. And he said, I'm going to tell you this because I'm not going to live long enough to tell people this. I can't go out and preach now because he was getting up there in you. And so I said, okay, what is it? He says, now, when the Spirit of God quickens this to you, you tell people that the solution to the attacks that are coming, and this is his exact words, they must learn to pray excessively in the Spirit. Then I said, now, Dan, what do you... Excuse me. I just have to give you a commentary right now. Paul made it even stronger. Yes, he did. He said, I yeah. pray without ceasing. Yeah. <laughs> but and he said, ahead. I speak with tongues more than all of you. Yes. So that's praying in the Spirit. No, he was Southern. He said, I speak with tongues more, more than, than y'all. 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 That's what he says. <laughs> that's what it says in the King James. <laughs> exactly. And so, uh, and so I said, Dad, what do you mean by excessively? He says, not your normal worshiping in church, not your normal praying in the Spirit, going to work. He said, you're going to have to go into a prayer chamber and pray in the spirit sometimes for 30 minutes to an hour to break stuff that's on you. 
He said, if you don't pray, and he looked at me and says this, if you and this generation does not learn how to pray in the Spirit, you're going to come under attacks that you're going to have a hard time coming out from, out from under. It's mandatory. Yeah, it's, it's a mandatory thing. And so um, when he said this to me about praying excessively, he says, now, do you remember your Uncle Rufus? Now, let me explain who Uncle Rufus was in case we get into a story about him. Rufus Stumford was my dad's uncle, and Rufus Stumford had a gift that when he was saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, he could speak in diverse tongues of any language in the world go up to any foreigner in the coal fields of West Virginia that worked in the mines of anywhere in the world and speak to them in tongues because a lot of those people came from other countries and they couldn't speak English well. So nobody could witness to him. So he preached to them and witnessed to them, and they just thought he knew the language. Uh, they even thought he was a Catholic priest when he speak Latin. They'd call him <laughs> Father Dumford because <laughs> they, they, they thought he was a Catholic priest. Now, when Dad said, do you remember Uncle, your Uncle Rufus? said, your Uncle Rufus, every morning would pray on his knees. And that's why my dad, I pray walking or standing up, but my dad never prayed without praying on his knees because he said, Rufus told him, for this cause I bow my knees before the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so my dad never prayed without praying on his knees. But Rufus would pray till his daughter, and his daughter happens to attend, attend, attends a Baptist church in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, I believe. But she said, I watched my dad pray in tongues. And he would bounce on the floor. He would get anointed. And when the glory would hit him, he'd bounce on his knees all over the place. And you'd think the ceiling was going to fall in downstairs at the kitchen. <laughs> now, Rufus would pray so long in the spirit, but when he would come out, he would say to, my, he would say to dad, the Lord just told us we've got to drive two hours down the road and pray for this person. And dad said, what are you talking about? And he would have a word of knowledge about someone's need or someone's situation. And his wife, I wish they'd have given me the book. I didn't ask for the book, but I have no idea what happened. She had before and after pictures. They would take pictures of people with cancers on their face before he prayed and cancers a month later after they were completely healed. I mean, they had before. She showed me this girl had this. Here's the before and after. This one had this. Here's an older picture of her when she couldn't walk. Here she is walking around, standing up, praising God. I mean, this was so when you say, and I say this very humbly before the Lord, that the Lord let me be raised around men personally. Now, this is not an Internet story who knew to hear the voice of the Lord and respond to it that quick. The one that you know, we talked about earlier, that one of the mistakes the church makes is to customize services for right. people and not permit the Holy Spirit. The second thing we do is we pray, but we don't listen. I can't tell you how many times I'd be talking to my wife and I'd say, honey, I'm here. And she says, yes, you're hearing, but you're not listening. Look at all the, all the women laughing. They know what I'm talking about. You're hearing, but you're not listening. So my dad said this to me. He said, everybody I know that knows how to pray can pray, but some of them don't know how to hear. They're not listening. Now, in the Spirit, and I feel the anointing real strong right now, in the Spirit of God, you have to learn the voice of God, and you have to learn to act at that moment. Too many people sit in a service and feel impressed to give something, and they talk themselves out of it. They think, maybe I feel like I should talk to this person. They're new and just maybe minister mm -hmm. to them. Well, I better not. I should call this person. Yeah, I, 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 that's do. right. And, you, you know, you, you find out later they were depressed and about to kill themselves. Right. And your call would have come at the perfect time, or you find out that they're about to divorce, and you've got this word. You know, you're saying there, honey, the Lord just showed me that you and your husband, are in a, you've been in an argument, and you really don't do what you're about to do. And I'm telling you, you would be shocked at how, how often the Spirit of the Lord can use the body of Christ, but we just aren't paying attention. Listen, I get in a cab. I'm in Nevada, and I get a cab. We're on vacation. And I get in the cab, and I turn to the gentleman. And, you know, people in the this 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 42 Muslim countries a person could be from. I said, "Sir, you're from Egypt." He looks at me and says, "This is true." <laughs> and I said, "You're you were you're from Cairo." He said, "This is true." I said, "You've been here 10 years." And he got so afraid of me, he shut down and couldn't get me out of that place fast enough. <laughs> And I started, then I started talking to him about his family and stuff, and I think it, but then the reason God does that is to prove that the Spirit of God is real and to convince, if you'll read Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians 14, it's to convince the unbeliever that the secrets of his heart are manifest. Okay, I yeah. need you to repeat something to me. Okay. Before your father was, uh, went to heaven,